Okay, there is one more I forgot. It's tied to it, though. The fourth category of the objection is to recognize that, you know, you are who you are. You're the integrator. The whys of integration. You know, when I started this episode, I didn't know where it was going to go. And now I do. I'm the integrator. You're the integrator. Every Christian is the integrator. The whys of integration flow through the Christian. And we all ought to know that. Salt of the earth, hello. What does salt do? It integrates the taste of the food with itself, and therefore the food is preserved and, and tastier. It integrates taste and preservation. What is the Christian? Salia. The Christian is the integrator. Now, you can be integrating for better, or you can be integrating for worse. Okay? For yourself, for your region, for your nation. We've already gone through that part. But this is like, how do you view yourself? You have to view yourself in light of your future. I don't know anybody in Christendom that wouldn't agree with that. You're not who you are now. You you really are who you, where you're going. Who are you? You're bought by the blood of Christ. Who are you? Your royal family of God. Who are you? Your king in training. Who are you? You're the salt of the earth. Who are you? You're responsible. You have a job here to learn and live on Bible. And then when God is pleased with that, Matthew 4, 4, always occurring, he blesses everybody around you. There is no good deed that can compete with that. There is no good deed that can substitute for that. All the money on the planet cannot compare to a thimble full of God's, what do you want to call it, pleasure and decree, okay, I'm going to do this because I'm so pleased with brain out learning something. There's nobody on earth other than another believer who's also learning and living on the Bible who can, who can do anything with that. It just It just can't. If you took all the good deeds that were ever done in the history of the planet from the beginning of time to the end of time and you piled them all up, they would not be a fingernail's thickness high by comparison. Because there's no comparison between the divine and the human in quality. Hopefully you get that. Because everything that God chooses to do, He's doing for all eternity. Okay, everything He chooses has eternal ramifications. The same you could argue for yourself. But hello, you're you, little. God's big. And He's taking a little thing. You do remember? What was that? You just. Um, what was. Um, Oh, faithful and little, faithful and much. That was it. Christ said that in the gospel somewhere. Okay, you're faithful in a little thing. And and at the time you're really doing it when you actually are faithful, you don't think of yourself as faithful. You're doing it for other reasons. You're doing it because it's right, it's gorgeous, you want him, blah, blah, blah. That's true faithfulness. It's not, I'm being faithful. If that's what you're thinking to yourself, you're not faithful. Because when you're thinking to yourself, I'm being faithful, then you're really not being faithful to God. You're being faithful to your own image of yourself to pat yourself on the back. So you're being unfaithful. It's when you're not thinking that you're faithful. You're doing it for other reasons. You want to know him. He's gorgeous. This doctrine's exciting. It's important. You want to understand it. Like, you know, you pursue eating good food, watching a good movie. You're really interested in it. Then you're faithful. He sees that and he's so excited because he, you know, views it the same way only to an infinite level. 
He's so excited to see it reflected because it's still doctrine. The fact that it's in you, it's still what it is. Its quality is not reduced by the fact that it's in you. Treasure and earthen vessels, end of Romans 9. Okay? So, his pleasure said, ah, yeah, look at, look at that doctrine that's in Bray now. Okay, I'm going to bless Houston in some way that he decides. I don't know. All the good deeds of Houston cannot compare to whatever it was he decided he was going to do. So am I going to want to use doctrine? You bet. Because can, can I do those good deeds for Houston? Uh-uh. But he can. Or Zimbabwe or I don't know, wherever he assigns it. <clears throat> And conversely, and this is another benefit of it, there might be somebody in Zimbabwe who I don't know them, they don't know me, and something they're doing is going to have an effect on something I need. So he's going to bless that person in Zimbabwe because I'm going to end up needing something that that person is attached to in some chain of, you know, six degrees of separation. Okay? That's how this works. That's how the integration works. It's integrated. It's connected. Right now. Not tomorrow. Not only in the eternal state. Right now. It's like the game of dominoes. Only you can't see what the other players have got. And you can't see what tiles the other players are playing. Or if you like mahjong, then mahjong. Okay, <clears throat> that's that's the game that this is. So you, you, who am I? I'm the integrator. God is integrating everything through me for my future kingdom, and it's mine to lose. What, what was that? You, you oh God, I, I just barely heard it. It's in Revelation three. Something to the effect, be careful that you don't lose your crown. Meaning that you got one. Might not be Revelation 3. It might be 1 Corinthians 15. The two, the two, the two passages are, are... He linked them. I'm really tired, okay? So I'm not hearing as well as I ought to. Or maybe, maybe he just wants me to just catch the glimpse of it. I don't know. Just go look them up. Revelation 3 and 1 Corinthians 15. The point is, is that you're, you're already designated. God is the one who takes you to the finish line. All you do is you keep voting, yes, carry me, carry me, carry me, carry me. Okay? And then you try to use it. And then he enables it to work. And if it doesn't work, that you don't worry about that. You just get up and do it again. And again and again and again. That makes you the integrator. You're literally integrating your life with the doctrine by doing that. Because you keep associate, associate, associate. What does doctrine have to do with this email? What does doctrine have to do with going to the bathroom? What does doctrine have to do with what I pick for breakfast? What does doctrine have to do with whether I make a left turn? You see? And you get in that habit and you're literally creating those dots on the diagonal line of your own life. Your life is a blank sheet of paper, and God's drawing wants to draw a diagonal line from lower left to upper right. And then everything in your life is supposed to be integrated, and then he creates the transverse lines. And that page is your life, because that page is going to become your kingdom. Now, it sounds real good to talk about it. Playing it out is really kind of um, boring at times. And, and the repetition, what do I, how does the doctrine apply? How does the doctrine apply? How does the doctrine apply? It, it, at times it can seem like something like a stupid catechism. But you, you get creative with it. See, so you're ruling on how you live. Do you want to live like a typical human, nose to the ground, knowing nothing, guessing everything, spending your life in all kinds of idle speculation and, and I don't know, not just idle speculation, but wasted time, 
If you want to live like that, that's your prerogative. But you can live on the higher plane of seeing how everything connects to him. Connect, 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 connect. That's integrating. And because you get all those integration points built and you become that sheet of paper with the diagonal line and all the transepts, then you're eligible to be king. And everybody will be transcepted to you. Everybody you're assigned to. And they will gain spiritual growth from watching you. Because that's the life they chose down here. They chose to watch each other. They chose to do things. They chose to be religious. They did not choose to learn and live on Bible. Even if they learned the Bible, it isn't real learning. It's just rote learning. I don't know how much you notice in school and how much you notice in, in you know, churches. They don't really teach you Bible. They teach you a lot of words. And then you remember the words. And the way they teach you these words, this happened to David, this happened to Abraham, this happened to Moses, this happened to Adam and Eve. And you can repeat the stories. And for all that repetition, do you actually understand the meaning of the story of Abraham? The meaning of the story of David? And if you went to your typical Christian... Or, unfortunately, pastor. And so, well, what's the meaning of the story of Abraham? Abraham was faithful, and he gave up his only begotten son. That's not the meaning of the story. I'm sorry, it's really not. It's Abraham became so dedicated and didn't even know. And God had to give him a test for him to find out that yes, he was mature and dedicated to God. It wasn't until he's got the knife at his son's throat that he actually knows there's no barriers between God and him. It was Abraham's cross for him. For his sake to understand it. And to a lesser extent also for Isaac. God, Because Isaac was not a child when this happened. See this is the stuff that they don't tell you. You can recite all kinds of stuff in the Bible. But you understand it. Answer no. So who's going to be the integrator in heaven. To integrate all this meaning. You know what was it like for Abraham. To live day after day after day after day for so long from age 75 to age 99 and there's no kid. Genesis 12, Genesis 15, Genesis 17. You're going to have, if you can number the stars of the sky, then you can number your kids. Oh, but there are no kids. The promise was given to him when he was 75 years old. By the time he's 83, the promise had just been reiterated. And then nothing happens. That's Genesis 15. And Genesis 16, right after that. Nothing has happened. He's 83 years old. Finally, Sarah, his own wife, says, she's still called Sarai at that point, meaning contentious bitch. Sarai says to him, hey, Maybe God wants to give you a kid through my maid instead of me directly. Go sleep with my maid. Abraham twerped that he is because he wasn't a good guy. That's the other thing they don't tell you. He sleeps with her because his wife says so. See, Adam gave in to the wife. Abram gave in to the wife. Instead of giving in to God. See, Adam didn't listen to God, but listened to his wife. 
Abram didn't listen to God, but listened to his wife. He just finished getting the contract again in Genesis 15. Genesis 16 is the story of Hagar. Abraham lied about his wife so he wouldn't get killed. Again, not listening to God. Again, listening to some human. How come that isn't stressed? How come Abraham is put up as this, the patriarch, this perfect example of a guy who lived a perfect life? And the Jews do that a lot. I remember hearing that as a kid. Oh, Abraham was the perfect patriarch. He did all of his mitzvot. Yeah, right. Abraham was a scallywag. Sorry. And yet God integrated all of salvation through him. Ever notice that? So if you're not a scallywag like Abraham, if you wouldn't lie about your wife in order to save your own skin, if you wouldn't hearken to the voice of your wife and go sleep with someone because she can't give you kids, then you're not as bad as Abraham. So God can use you as an integrator too. And let's say you're worse than Abraham. You're a bigger scallywag than that. Because, I mean, he was still bad when he was 100 years old. Or nearly 100. Because when he's 99, after he gets the promise from God, your son's going to be named Isaac this time next year. So now, Sarah's pregnant. She's been renamed Sarah. His sexual ability was restored. So is her. She's pregnant. They're on some kind of road, I forget. And I want to say that's Genesis 18. And Abimelech likes the way Sarah looks, baby. And she's 90 years old at this point. How do you look that good when you're 90 years old? I don't know. But then, you know, she was rejuvenated. So I guess that's how. Abimelech, Abraham lies yet again. It's, she's, she's my sister. So he won't get killed. And so he takes her into his harem. And then God goes to Abimelech in a dream and says, uh, <clears throat> uh, I know you're the king and you're going to take sexual rights over anybody you want, but you took my servant Abraham's wife. And Abimelech goes back to Abraham and says, Hey, why'd you lie to me? See? Abraham was a mature believer at that time. You want to talk about a putz? And yet all oh, the Jews all praise him. Abraham, our forefather. Honey, you're praising a putz. Now, of course, some Jews do know that, and they will admit that, you know. But that's not something you hear in shul on Saturday, okay? He was a putz. Okay, so now here's your here's the application. I'm an integrator. I'm royal family of God. I was bought by the blood of Christ. I'm not who I am on my own. And who am I on my own? I'm a putz. And it doesn't matter. If God can take putz Abraham, God can take me. If God can use a stone and turn it into a loaf of bread, then he can take me. And I'm an integrator because he says so. There's no accounting for taste. That's something that you use to defend against the objections and the feeling small and inferior and God shouldn't take me and all those other objections that come up. The flip side too though is when you start to not like the job and you will. I hate this job every day. I'm going to be a king. I can't think of a worse job on earth. If you ask me right now, what kind of a job do you want for your life? This is the last on the list. I think being a ruler, being in charge, being a king is right up there with fingernails on a blackboard. 
but it's the only way to get close to him. So you're going to have a lot of days when you don't like this job. So then you remember again, I'm the integrator. If I don't grow, if I don't do my job, somebody's going to get hurt. Because when you're the king, it's always your kingdom that gets hurt, never you. Even if the enemy comes in and invades, it's your life they're going to spare. Because they can do something with you. You're valuable property to them. So they're not going to hurt you. They're not going to hurt the prince, the princess, you know, the close members of the upper echelon. They'll ransom you, or they'll protect you, or they'll do something. It's your kingdom they'll ransack. You get protected. They get hurt. That's worse than you getting hurt. Christ lived like this. Every day he wakes up in the morning. I'm Messiah. Can you, can't you imagine that there were a lot of times when he didn't like that being true? So now you know more like what it was like for him. And this stops being this ethereal, la-la land, mystical body of Christ. It's a very real repetition of the pattern of his life when he was down here, right in the trenches. It stops being the la-la land Christianity we've been pandered to for so long. That's why Christians quit. They don't get what this is. Of course, there's a big enough reason to quit once you know what this is. And when you want to quit, once you know what this is, then you'll understand what it was like for him to be here. I'm Messiah over all these nitwits. I'm supposed to save them. My living this thought life before you, Father, is, is so that these nitwits who are never going to care, they're always going to be low, the poor I'm always going to have with me, they're really not going to benefit from this because they're not interested. And they're not going to be interested in heaven either. You want me to pay for this? Now, he wouldn't be human if he didn't have that attitude sometime. And obviously the answer is, okay, I'll pay anyhow. That's not sinning. That's being aware of the facts. And not liking the facts. You cannot like the facts. It's not a sin to dislike the facts. Because some facts are truthfully dislikable. They're, they're, some facts are not good. Some facts are not nice. Some facts are not pleasant. It's not a sin to dislike them. And in heaven, those facts are going to be there. You're the integrator. It's due to you that whatever benefit they get, and it'll be a dot of knowledge about him, It'll be due to you. And it won't be pleasant all the time. But it's the toughest job you'll ever love. And you will love it. That's what he keeps on drilling into my head. Because I hate it now. But I'm going to love it then. That doesn't mean it's going to be pleasant. You know, there are a lot of things in life that you really do and you really want to do them and you keep on doing them, but they're not pleasant to do them. But you really want to do them. There are a lot of things we want to do that we don't find pleasant. It doesn't stop us from wanting to do it. Pleasant just makes it more enjoyable to do it. The integrity of a person is measured by whether they have to have it be pleasant. If you have to have it be pleasant in order to do it, then you don't have much integrity. You don't have much discernment either. That's one reason my audios tend to be so long. I don't want the fly-by-night. The fly-by-night Christian, let them go somewhere else. 
This is substantive stuff. It's heavy stuff. It's hard to talk about. It's hard to hear. And if you're sticking it out, then that means that God's doing something to you with it that's of substantial value. I'm not doing anything to you. I'm learning. I'm benefiting from it right now. Whether you also benefit from it when you hear it, I don't know. But God did that. And he isn't going to do it to a fly-by-night. This isn't fly-by-night Christianity. This is in the trenches where Christ walked. You want to walk where Jesus walked? This is where he walked. I'm the Messiah. I'm the integrator. I get up every single day and I see all these blank faces and I see all these people who couldn't care less. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I got to grow for their sake. And they're not going to care even in heaven. But I'm still going to grow and I'm still going to do that because there's going to be one dot. And besides, I just love this doctrine so much. I got to kill myself for it. That's what's going to happen to the integrator. You, me, him. That's what happens. So you're living the way God is living. God throws himself down before the truth. That's Psalm 138 too. David is throwing himself down on the floor of Mount Moriah, on the very bedrock that would become the Holy of Holies, on the very bedrock that is now underneath the Dome of the Rock, the Muslim temple. That used to be the Holy of Holies of the, you know, real temple. And will be again. I mean, presumably. I mean, not in the eternal state, but at least during the millennium. David is laying down on that rock. He's prostrate because... He realizes that, you know, all the promise of Messiah is going to be, you know, one of his kids and all the rest of it. He's just dumbfounded by that. Because he's just finished sinning one of his biggest sins of all time. Trying to number the people. And that story is told at the end of Second Samuel. That's how come I, I know. Okay, so he's lying prostrate on the floor, the, the bedrock, the Petra... Christ's own nickname for himself in Matthew sixteen eighteen, He's laying on that Petra. He's, oh, my God. You put the truth above your own name. Psalm 138 is what he was saying when he was laying down like that. That's how you be. That's how I'll be if we make it to kingship. You want to kill yourself for the truth. I'm not there yet. I know that's what it's going to be like. Sometimes I'm like that for moments. As you mature, you'll find out that you get like that for moments. You're just desperate. Desperate. To get the truth out, or to say it right, or to live it, or to have it, or something. So now look, as the integrator, it is so integrated into your life that you are integrating yourself into something else for the sake of getting that truth into something else, even if it doesn't work. Even if it's only a little bit. It looks to the outsider as masochistic and even sadistic. And you will be accused of being like that. People will be, you know, they'll think that you're trying to sell them. It's not. It's because you're so in love with it. You're not trying to sell them. You just can't stop. People can't stop talking about what they love. People can't stop thinking about what they love. And you go from doing the doctrine thing because you think you're supposed to to not wanting to do anything else. And you're just looking for any opportunity to put it out there. Well, you'll have a whole kingdom to do it to. And they'll need it. And they'll want it. And they'll love it. And they'll still not 
understand it. What you pour out to them will be in volumes. What they'll get out of it will be little dots every day. So it's a constant tension, a constant frustration. You know, God said there's no more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain, no more death. The old things have passed away. Okay, but he didn't say no more struggle. He didn't say no more challenge. But it's a challenge you love. And it'll be hard for them too. You're getting all this throughput coming out of you. And their, their throughput is one dot, another dot. Another dot, a drip, 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 drip. That's all they can absorb. But that's a lot to them. So then you do volumes again. And then drip, 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 drip at the bottom. Every day, all day, forever. Sounds horrible, doesn't it? But if it's what you love to do, then it's not horrible. Because you're the integrator. It's all in you, and it drips out to them. That's who you are. Talk to Dad about it.